uh, if I may, I would like to, you know, just, uh, you know, follow the program. And I would like to uh, ask uh, Dr. Andrei Kortonov, who is Director General of the Russian International Affairs Council, and Dr. Mehdi Sanayi, who is the head of the Institute for Iran Eurasia Studies uh, and senior advisor to the foreign minister of the Islamic Republic of Iran and former ambassador to Russia, uh, to uh, start our meeting with the welcoming remarks. Uh, if I may, uh, Dr. Kordonov, Andrei Vadimovich. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Ruslan. Uh, first of all, let me say that it is uh, definitely not uh, just my honor, but uh, also my pleasure uh, to open this webinar. Uh, I would like to underscore the importance uh, of this uh, line of communication at the second track level between the Russian Federation and the, Islam the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, definitely, uh, we need uh, more interaction at the academic level, and uh, I am glad that uh, we, together uh, with the Institute uh, for Iran-Eurasia Studies, uh, make our modest contribution uh, uh, into this uh, uh, noble goal. Uh, we are supposed to discuss uh, our approaches uh, to the recent developments uh, in the region. And indeed, uh, the region has never been short of uh, new developments. And uh, uh, the, the recent months uh, produced uh, many changes and uh, there are even more changes in the pipeline. Uh, some of uh, the developments that we should uh, reflect upon are, uh, uh, are outlined in the agenda. And uh, let me just uh, take uh, maybe three minutes of your time uh, going uh, through the list uh, of uh, what uh, has happened in the region and uh, what uh, might happen in the region within the next couple of months. Uh, first of all, of course, we all have to uh, analyze the implications uh, of the uh, new administration in Washington, D.C. upon relations between the United States uh, and Iran, but also upon a more general geopolitical situation uh, in the MENA region. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, I happen to know uh, the new uh, U.S. Uh, Envoy uh, on uh, Iranian issues, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Rob Malley. And I think that it's a good decision uh, to the extent uh, this position matters. Uh, uh, this person might uh, make a real good contribution to the uh, unofficial dialogue between the two countries, but also the dialogue at the official level as well. Uh, however, we also know how difficult it is uh, for the United States to change its uh, uh, current uh, <clears throat> not very constructive position on uh, GCPOA. <coughs> and we see that uh, on the Capitol Hill, not everybody uh, supports President Biden in his uh, intention to get back. Uh, to the multilateral agreement. Of course, the opposition, uh, especially among Republican uh, senators, would like to attach many strings to this decision. So uh, definitely it's one of the issues that uh, we should keep in mind while discussing the situation in the Middle East uh, and uh, uh, the, the future of this situation. Uh, I would also emphasize uh, the recent uh, diplomatic relations, uh, namely the re-establishment re of uh, diplomatic relations between Israel and a number of uh, uh, countries uh, in the Gulf. Uh, it's yet to be seen uh, what kind of political implications this change might bring with itself. But uh, definitely it's an important development that we should also keep in mind and we should uh, analyze uh, uh, when we discuss the future of the region. I would also add uh, this uh, uh, current rapprochement uh, between uh, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Qatar. It's too early uh, to argue that the crisis is over. 
that GCC is back to stage, but nevertheless, I think that uh, this rapprochement is something that we should keep an eye on. Uh, we should analyze in terms of uh, potential implications uh, on regional conflicts. For example, uh, this rapprochement might have implications for what's going on in uh, Libya right now and maybe in some other places, uh, uh, including East Africa. Uh, we will have elections uh, this year, elections in Syria, and I think it's an important uh, juncture uh, in the Syrian development, which might have repercussions uh, for the political regime uh, in Damascus, and will might also have some regional implications. And uh, if we are lucky, we might have elections in Libya. At least uh, for the time being, the elections are scheduled uh, for December of this year. Uh, and uh, uh, though I think we are very far from the from any final resolution of the Libyan conflict, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I think that we might have uh, some uh, very qualified optimism about uh, the current situation in Libya compared with where we were in the beginning of 2020. I think that uh, definitely a year ago, uh, the overall uh, uh, situation in uh, uh, Libya was uh, much more dangerous and uh, the <laughs> scale of violence was much higher than what we see right now. Um, among potential uh, positive developments, we can consider uh, Yemen as a situation which uh, is probably ripe for some kind of resolution, though even in case of, of Yemen, uh, this resolution will be difficult uh, and I can foresee procrastinations on this road. So there are many issues that we can discuss. I think that uh, the timing is right. I, I also hope that uh, we will have a very open and candid discussions as we always have with our partners at the Institute for Iran-Eurasia Studies. Let me also mention that uh, we would like uh, to present uh, our joint publication, uh, an occasional paper uh, produced uh, jointly uh, by Alexei Klebnikov uh, and uh, Mahmoud Shuri. Uh, I hope that uh, the authors uh, will uh, give us uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, reflections uh, on their paper. And unfortunately, we don't publish uh, uh, joint papers with uh, our Iranian partners uh, to Often, I hope that uh, we will uh, be in a position to upgrade the level of our cooperation and that we can produce uh, more interesting uh, materials together. Uh, so uh, let me uh, end up uh, with this, uh, saying that uh, I'm looking forward uh, to a very productive, very open uh, and uh, hopefully uh, 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 very a positive conversation uh, between Russians, Russian and Iranian experts today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kortanov. I'd like to mention that I have this uh, printed version of this uh, paper here, and uh, the introduction to this paper was co-offered by uh, Dr. Kortanov and uh, Ambassador Mehdi Sanayi. Ambassador, uh, I would like to, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very glad uh, to see Russian colleagues and especially Dr. Kortanov. Uh, and uh, I I I'm glad that uh, we have already published uh, joint publication uh, and hope also as Andre hoped uh, to continue this tradition and to have joint works and to publish them. Uh, cooperation of uh, Iran and Russia and a Syrian topic and in Syria is very important and uh, I think uh, this is exactly this is uh, one of the strategic sites uh, of uh, our cooperation in different aspects. Uh, it's uh, strategic and it's very important 
and it was fruitful and uh, had results in fighting terrorism and uh, both countries and all the world observed uh, the result of this cooperation. So, uh, when some uh, researchers uh, and some institutes uh, uh, talk about uh, Iranian and Russian cooperation, is it a strategic or not? Uh, Iranian and Russian relation is strategic or not? Usually I say that uh, this cooperation and regional cooperation exactly is the strategic side of our cooperation. And uh, it's important that it was uh, fruitful also. Uh, I think uh, it's very important to fix these results in uh, Syria and in the Middle East uh, and the uh, challenge of this cooperation is to fix it because as we know there is some challenges also uh, and some uh, difference of views but uh, Iranian Russian cooperation is uh, uh, as important as before and is continued now uh, the fact is that today in Sochi is going the trilateral uh, dialogue of Iran, Russia and Turkey. So so you selected a very good day and very good day uh, for organizing this webinar. Uh, about uh, our uh, regional uh, cooperation, I think there is an opportunity also to expand it. I remember that uh, I think I think there is a, such a potential to exercise it uh, in other region also, as Caucasus, for example. Uh, I hope that I, I remember that in 2019 uh, uh, we have agreed with the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs to have a dialogue on Caucasus also. Uh, unfortunately, it was it was initiated, but it was not continued. It it was preparing, and uh, I hope uh, that it will uh, this preparation will be continued. And I I think it if if we had such a dialogue, maybe we uh, were more prepared for uh, late Karabakh conflict. So I think uh, this uh, experience in Syria uh, can help us to expand such uh, and to repeat such cooperation in other regions, also other important regions. Uh, we can talk about it, uh, our institute can uh, think about it. Uh, some points about GCPOA also, as you know, GCPOA is in a very difficult and critical situation. And uh, I think uh, the role of uh, Russia and included here China also is important now. As two participants and two friends country of Iran, the role of Russia and uh, uh, China also is important now. So, uh, Iran complained uh, it's uh, during years its obligations uh, in GCPOA and uh, United States got out from this uh, agreement. Uh, Iran also is not responsible for changing uh, Presidents in United States, one signed, one got out, and one is now thinking about to return to get back or not. Uh, this is right at Iran that is waiting uh, to be cancelled the sanctions. And so uh, I think uh, 
a few months in future are very important. It's very important time for GCPUA and the role of Russia also is great. I think uh, in the end, I want to add that uh, bilateral relation of Iran and Russia also is important and can be a topic of our discussion in future conversation. Uh, maybe uh, uh, Dr. Kortunov uh, remembers that we initiated uh, in 2014 uh, a very wide conference on Iran and Russian relations with Riyadh. Iras and React together organized. Uh, this conference really helped me very much as ambassador. It was in the beginning of my work. Very serious conference with the Russian, Iranian participants. Maybe uh, Dr. Sajin remembers it. Uh, this conference gave us, uh, gave us very uh, good ideas, very important ideas. Uh, um, no, of, of course, uh, related to this year and to 2013, 2014, Iranian-Russian uh, relation uh, is uh, developed very much, but it's very important to review all the period and it's important to uh, save this uh, good relation and uh, think about new ideas and to fix this cooperation in Middle East, to develop it in Middle East, in other region, and in international level and in bilateral also. And so uh, I want to hope that we may uh, organize together again a very good conference in 2020 uh, 21. Uh, so let's to think about it. So in the end, uh, I can hope more cooperation with uh, uh, Iras and Riyadh, and this is honor for us also. This We see it as a tradition now, and I hope it will be continue, continued and developed, and we will have opportunity uh, to see our friends more and more. Thank you, Ambassador Sanai. Uh, Андрей Вадимович, если будет что-то добавить, uh, мы можем перед тем, как начать сессию, вам сказать, и, или мы продолжим. Uh, uh, well, if I just uh, might uh, say that I fully agree with uh, Ambassador Sanai, as I always do, by the way, I fully agree with him that uh, the time has come uh, uh, to have uh, uh, another uh, representative conference between Russia and Iran, and I hope that uh, the uh, coronavirus uh, situation will not prevent us uh, uh, from uh, from doing so. So let's consider planning, and uh, if we uh, cannot do it uh, uh, offline, which would be definitely an omission, uh, we can at least do something online. But I do hope that we'll be able to see some of our Iranian friends in Moscow and uh, definitely we would be glad to welcome you here uh, and uh, uh, to continue uh, this uh, uh, conversation, not just uh, in such a uh, remote way, but uh, also in person. So uh, I think that we should start working on that uh, and let's see how it goes. Thanks. Thank you very much. Or uh, definitely we could uh, also consider ideas of uh, holding some conference in Tehran, why not? So it depends. Uh, I would like to. Yes, of uh, course, you are welcome. Te Tehran also is a good idea. So uh, thank you. So we can start our uh, panel discussion. And I would like to start with uh, our offers of this uh, working paper that we uh, published in the end of the last year. Uh, and uh, I would like to start with the uh, Russian expert Alexei Hlebnikov. Uh, who is a React expert, and uh, Alexey, could you kindly share with us your view uh, uh, on what is uh, what is the current uh, situation around Syria, and how do you see the prospects for Russia and Iranian engagement in Syria? Thank you. Well, thank you, Ruslan, and thank you, uh, everyone, for participating in this event. Thank you, React, for organizing it. 
and for the opportunity to share my thoughts and analysis on such important topic uh, in the region. Well, uh, to save more time, I'll briefly focus uh, on um, rather on challenges than on uh, some um, some positive uh, agendas, which are always easy to uh, to define and to highlight, but uh, it's more difficult to uh, uh, to spot uh, some um, negative or uh, difficult um, trends in um, in conflicts and in uh, in the policies. Well, um, if we look at the Syrian conflict in general, um, I suggest to look to it through, uh, or maybe to uh, deconstruct it into four uh, dimensions, uh, military, political, international, and uh, socio-economic dimensions. Uh, each of them uh, basically provides us with uh, lots of million dollar questions. And uh, uh, I don't know who knows the uh, correct answer to them, but at least we're all trying to do our best to uh, highlight them and uh, propose certain uh, initiatives. Well, let me start with um, the military dimension. So although the military stage of the conflict uh, has been coming to an end, uh, shifting more to a political realm, uh, there's still quite a um, lot of issues in this dimension. The country is still um, not under the government control. Uh, government forces uh, control about 62-65% of the uh, territory. Um, Syrian democratic forces, uh, dominated by Kurds and backed by the United States, control 30% of the territory. Uh, and uh, Turkey-backed opposition forces, together with Turkish forces, also occupy about 4 or 5% of the country. So, uh, speaking about this, we cannot talk about the territorial integrity and sovereignty of, uh, of Syria as a state. This is why this military dimension will continue to be uh, on the agenda and continue to deliver a lot of difficulties and challenges ahead to all um, actors involved, Russia, Turkey, Iran, United States, um, Israel. So basically, the military presence not only of other foreign powers which present in uh, Syria illegally, which are uh, Turkey and the Americans, but also Israeli attacks uh, and uh, on Iranian and uh, Syrian targets inside the country also complicate this issue. And also we witness the um, sort of resurgence of ISIS in, uh, in the desert areas in, uh, um, and uh, in the east of the country. Switching to the political dimension. Um, the political dimension uh, here also presents uh, more uh, challenges than uh, than opportunities, unfortunately. The there is uh, quite obvious lack of progress with uh, constitutional committee work. Although it is a great achievement that such institution, not institution, but a body was formed, it still fails to produce some substantial results on the political uh, track. Uh, both parties, uh, the government, the Syrian government and the opposition uh, hinder the progress uh, in this way, uh, not being ready to compromise or make uh, some concessions uh, to moving towards the, the uh, some mid positions. Um, so basically, the mutual, mutual inflexibility here uh, is one of the major um, obstacles. Um, also, the lack of progress between um, Kurds, Syrian Kurds and Damascus presents another uh, huge challenge here. Um, basically, 
Kurds control uh, about 30% of uh, the country's territory, uh, and uh, which also equals about 30% of uh, 30, 40% of energy or uh, 40, 50% of energy sources, uh, oil, uh, fuels, and gas, and about 40% of Syrian agricultural lands. And without um, incorporating back SDF held areas uh, under the government, Syrian government control, it's very hard, almost impossible to talk about the um, intra-Syrian reconciliation and uh, revival, reactivation of the country's economy. Uh, this is why it brings us to another uh, question, the upcoming presidential elections, which are scheduled this summer. And uh, just some brief, uh, quick, quick numbers that uh, according to the UN data, in 2020, uh, the Syrian population was estimated at 17.6 uh, million people living inside the country. Uh, and about 6.6 6, uh, million refugees residing uh, abroad. And out of this 17.6 million, uh, million uh, Syrians living inside the country, uh, about 11 Point six million people live under the government control areas, which is about 65% of Syrians who reside inside the country live on these government control areas. So uh, with Damascus plans to uh, get elections, uh, I mean, uh, conduct presidential elections only in the areas under the government control, basically means that uh, it's going to be the vote only of 65% of Syrians who reside inside the country. If we compare it with the overall number of Syrians, uh, uh, it is only 47% of all Syrians, including those who fled the country. So it's not very much representative, and certainly that will face uh, uh, great opposition from the European side, from uh, the United States, and will add more uh, complexity to the uh, Russian attempts to uh, launch reconciliation process between uh, Damascus and, uh, and Europe. Well, as I mentioned already, uh, yeah, political dimension probably is one of the most uh, challenging ones here. Um, let's switch to another international dimension, uh, which is also quite important. Um, since the first year of the um, uprising, the conflict has become uh, an international in its character. A number of um, foreign actors involved is quite significant. It's Russia, Turkey, Iran, the United States, Israel, it's just those who directly involved in uh, military activities on the ground uh, in Syria and Israel with its uh, airstrikes. So, uh, with that much uh, military present on the ground uh, doesn't help to ease the tensions or decrease the risk of confrontation between uh, these actors. Um, there is enough disagreements between Russia and Turkey, which are so far successfully managed to find the way how to avoid confrontation uh, but still, uh, as I already mentioned, the uh, Idlib, uh, issue of Idlib, the uh, north of Aleppo, uh, east of Euphrates, uh, where Turkey de facto occupies uh, Syrian uh, land, and also, not even militarily, but how Turkey approaches the um, uh, economically and socially uh, areas which it controls. Uh, already for a year, uh, Turkish lira has become the official currency on those areas. Uh, for example, Turkish companies who started to uh, make uh, contracts with uh, uh, local electric companies for uh, which they sell uh, electricity or uh, other things, their long-term contracts starting minimum at 10 years. And uh, that means that basically Turkey is there uh, to stay for a long time. And uh, that's a big issue also for, for Russia, how to find compromise a solution here. So in the long run, 
uh, there is going to be a problem and uh, risks for such escalation between Russia and Turkey and uh, Syria remains um, quite quite high. Um, also, the same applies to other um, actors present inside Syria. The United States military, uh, Iranian military present, which uh, presence, uh, which provokes um, partly uh, Israeli attacks. Uh, in, uh, on targets inside Syria, which doesn't help Russia to uh, basically um, try to reconcile Damascus uh, with uh, with Europe. So uh, the international uh, dimension also includes the uh, intra Arab reconciliation, and here we have more hopes because over the last two years we uh, witnessed um, some. Um, signs of reconciliation between uh, Syria and uh, UAE and Bahrain. Uh, now Algeria also is uh, becoming more interested in developing economic uh, cooperation and helping Syria. So uh, first signs uh, are in place. Of course, it's still a long way uh, before we'll see uh, Syria back into the Arab F uh, family, being back, being integrated back into the regional economy and uh, studying, benefiting from it, but uh, the, these first steps are all also important to, uh, to highlight. And socio-economic dimension, which uh, includes uh, such challenges as uh, sanctions, which are uh, complicated uh, largely by the crisis in Lebanon, which affected uh, Syria immensely, uh, COVID pandemic, uh, and all of this uh, leading to uh, constantly worsening socio-economic situation, which uh, already led to humanitarian um, uh, almost catastrophes. And uh, the issue of finding the ways how to increase the flow of humanitarian aid uh, to Syria is also should be on the agenda. And here Russia and Iran uh, should um, uh, should catalyze their attempts uh, to uh, to find the ways how to increase that. I would say just uh, make yeah. a list one. Uh, one. Yeah, I'm here. So basically, uh, these four uh, dimensions which I mentioned, they represent uh, uh, quite a multi-layered pie of this complicated Syrian conflict. And in all of these uh, four dimensions, there is uh, quite a lot of room for Russia-Iranian cooperation. This is not to say that uh, our countries don't have uh, differences uh, or different approaches or different views on certain issues of the Syrian conflict. But uh, the uh, already five years of uh, interaction and cooperation on the ground in Syria, they already established and created quite a good and solid basis for the future uh, partnership, future coordination inside Syria. So. Uh, Hopefully that will develop and uh, our two countries will avoid uh, potential risks of escalation because, as I already mentioned, uh, there is more and more uh, the risks of escalation in Syria among all uh, actors involved, foreign actors, are rising. And I hope that uh, also thanks to our analysis and contribution we could help it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexei. Uh... Uh, definitely, we hope that uh, uh, the situation in Syria and the uh, Russian-Iranian engagement in Syria will develop uh, and expand in its nature. Uh, this is also something that uh, Ambassador Sanai said earlier, that we need to think how uh, how to prepare some new ideas on, on, on how these real relations could expand and this cooperation could expand. Um, here I would like to give the floor to uh, Mahmoud Shuri, who is the Deputy Director uh, of the Institute for Iran Eurasia Studies. Uh, and Dr. Shuri, could you kindly share with us your view on the uh, Russia-Iran relations uh, in the post, uh, uh, we will say, post-Trump era? Thank you. Thank you, Roslan. And uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is uh, an honor for me to uh, speak in this valuable gathering. Uh, first of all, 
I would like to thank all the friends who accepted the invitation of uh, Iras Institute and Council of Foreign Relations of Russia to participate in this discussion. Uh, if you allow me, as you said, uh, in this short time, I would like to make a few points about the prospect of Iran-Russia relations in the post-Trump era. I deliberately use the term uh, post-Trump in this title because I believe we will not enter the Biden era at least until the short term. My claim actually addresses two issues. First, the consequences and eff effects of the uh, Trump's era, in my opinion, will remain in the world for a long time, and uh, specifically on Iran-U.S. Uh, relation and even Iran-Russia relations. And second, uh, the Biden government is too weak for the uh, foreseeable future to be able to make big decision. decision. If these two complementary uh, claims are true, it means that we have to wait for an era in which any kind of uh, unforeseen and uncontrolled event uh, will occur, but uh, both uh, positively and negatively. Biden came to power in the United States when Iran doesn't have much time to wait to see if the Americans kept their uh, pr uh, promises. That is why we are facing a complicated situation. In this situation, the only option for Iran is to change the pressure balance uh, and turn unilateral pressure, in, uh, pressure into balanced and re uh, re receive local uh, pressure. This strategy is likely to put even Iran, Iran's friends, such as Russia and China, in difficult position because it forces them to choose between bad and worse options. However, in my opinion, this, this situation, if we want to be frank and fair, is in part a product of inadequate and in some cases, a co-local uh, confront confrontation of other uh, great powers in relation to Trump's withdrawal from JCPOA. Uh, don't forget that Trump, in a completely irresponsible manner, destroyed one of the most important and hard-won international agreements reached in the post-Cold War era, which could have played an important role in international peace and functioning for a functioning of nuclear disarmament regimes in such a way that there is a little chance of its uh, full revival. Also, Russia has diplomat diplomatically state stated its formal uh, opposition to U.S. withdrawal from JCPOA on several occasions and tried to keep to keep it until the last moment and especially played an important role in neutralizing the U.S. efforts to use the trigger mechanism and the con continuation of Iran's arms embargoes. In practice, many Russian economic institutions, especially Russian oil companies, were among the first to exit from Iran in fear of secondary U.S. sanctions. After the withdrawal of the United States from JCPOA, our banking relations were severely disrupted and at some point had many negative effects on economic and trade cooperation between Iran and Russia. Of course, since the past years, since the past year, thanks to the preferential trade agreement between Iran and Eurasia, the Eurasian Union, we are again witnessing a rela relative increase in trade between Iran and Russia, but Iran-Russia relations, according to many Iranian and Russian experts, have definitely far more potential for economic cooperation compared to the increase of several hundred million dollars in trade relations. At present, even Iran-Russia cooperation in the Bushehr II and III nuclear power plant projects is affected by 
Iran's $40 million de debt and the strategic north-south uh, uh, corridor project could not progress significantly because of U.S. sanction after two decades of its beginning. In any case, there is no de denying that with Trump's withdrawal from, uh, of JCPOA in 2018, we witnessed that Iran-Russia relation, which began to become more prosperous, has, have experienced a decline. And in fact, we saw a return to the area of minimal cooperation that was a feature of uh, Iran-Russia relation in period before the JCPOA agreement. Undoubtedly, the uh, ideal situation is uh, uh, ideal situation was that we, uh, we could remove the American factor from the relation between the two countries and forge our relation on the basis of our mutual uh, cap capabilities and attractiveness. But the reality is that, unfortunately, whatever past Iran-Russia relations take, there seems to be no escape from U.S. issues, U.S. issue. In, in fact, the U.S. factor in Iran-Russia relations is a still more important factor that, as much as it may bring Iran and Russia closer to each other and increase the need for cooperation between them, can also lead to create a gap or reduction of cooperation between the two. Of course, I think the issue of Syria may be an exception in this regard in uh, Iran-Russia relation. In, in the case of Syria, Tehran and Moscow for the first time pursued a strategic partnership to achieve uh, the ultimate goal, regardless of U.S. consideration or opposition. Uh, such a level and form of cooperation created uh, the expectation that the two countries would pay less attention to the elements of U.S. intervention in their strategic consideration and taking the next, next steps. But the policy of maximum U.S. pressure under Trump, as noted earlier, effectively reduced Iran-Russia cooperation from a strategic level on the Syrian issue to a minimum level of cooperation. Minimal, co minimal uh, cooperation is, in my opinion, a situation in which economic cooperation is reduced to trade cooperation. And not, neither side will achieve a strategic achievement through cooperation. And the two sides, in the best case, try not to inflict uh, strategic losers on the other side. As a final point, I would like to point out that also Iran-Russia uh, relations have played an important role in the two countries' strategic, uh, strategies over the past three decades and have significantly increased the ability of both countries to act in recent years. They have not been taken seriously in, their, in either country for serious reasons. This, I believe, is because the Iran-Russia relationship is an asymmet asymmetric uh, one that both sides prefer to remain silent about it. Uh, uh, I, uh, I believe is because uh, it, this I believe is because the Iran-Russia relationship is an asymmetric one that both sides prefer to remain silent about it, but this asymmetry manifests its consequences in various subjects. Asymmetry means that Iran Russia and Russia don't, don't think of cooperating uh, with each other from the same position, while Iran leaders, unfortunately, without the necessary capacity, think of an equal and even strategic relationship with Russia. This is not necessarily the case with Russia. Russia view from uh, view of Iran, as I understand as an Iranian analyst, is completely pragmatic, non-ideological -ide view based on accurate cost-benefit calculations and depth depends on time and space. That is why can we 
that is why we can have strategic cooperation in the Syria, but in the Caucasus, Iran is excluded from the equations or this at the same time as trying to hold a joint naval exercises exercise in Indian Ocean, we see the use of fake name for the Persian Gulf in the official tweet of uh, the Russian Foreign Ministry. There are many such paradoxical issue in Iran-Russia relations, and I think that this historical problem will not be solved until both countries, as in the case of Syria, enter into a relationship with equal and symmet symmetrical capacities, contributions, perceptions, and expectations. Uh, this last point may not have been very sweet, but I think we should be frankly. Uh, no, uh, uh, thank you for your pa uh, patience. Thank you very much, Dr. Shuri. I think that uh, there are some serious issues and uh, maybe we do not need uh, each time and every time talking to each other sweet things, but, uh, uh, you know, some, you know, direct uh, engagement uh, needs uh, needs uh, frank discussion. So I would like to uh, give the floor to um, to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Vladimir Sajan, who is a senior research fellow at the Institute of Oriental Studies of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Uh, uh, Dr. Sajan, could you kind of share with us your view on uh, on the future of the GCPOA and the Biden administration. Uh, yes, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would very like much. to mention that there are, uh, you know, from seven to ten minutes. And, okay. Uh, okay. Or, thank or, you very or, much. First of all, I would like to say to thank uh, all organizers for this online conference. I think that this conference is very important. Uh, for us, and the second, I would like to uh, to say that I am very glad to see our uh, my uh, Persian uh, friends, and uh, I think that our uh, uh, our uh, meeting uh, will take place not only with the help of uh, internet by but also uh, offline in Tehran or in Moscow. Thank you. I would like to say uh, some words about the situation around the GCPOA. Uh, everybody knows that uh, this problem is very complicated and uh, the specific problem of the GCPOA is that United States and Iran impose condition on each other, insisting on the first step of their uh, opponent. That is, Biden, for example, demands that Iran first return to the GCPOA of the year 2015. And only after that, the United States is ready to lift sanctions. Ayatollah Khamenei insists, first of all, on lifting the sanctions over the United States and other countries, and not in words or on paper, but in uh, reality with uh, verification by the by Iran, and only then provides for a gradual return of Iran to the GCPOA. This uh, requires negotiations. I mean to develop a road map for a gradual but positive moment forward for the formi uh, formi formi formation of mutual consequences on each uh, synchronic step. Uh, this opinion certainly uh, requires a significant amount of time and the desire of two two sides to conduct a constructive dialogue. Uh, however, the parties, I mean uh, the USA and Iran, 
do not have any time. Iran demands uh, the lifting of sanctions by February 21st. It's not real. President Biden's opinion are limited. We know that uh, the US law on the review of the nuclear agreement with Iran, uh, I, this uh, uh, law, I, N-A-R-A, -A, adopted in May uh, 2015, is still in force. Joe Biden cannot, without cons uh, consultation with Congress and his decisions, take drastic uh, measures to lift sanctions against Iran without evidence of Iran's return to the GCPOA, or at least the beginning of this process. In addition, the new Biden administration cannot resolve the issue of lifting all financial and economic sanctions in a few weeks. The economy is a huge ship, it is not able to respond instantly to, to certain impacts. Its uh, maneuverability and mobility are low. Even after the announcement of lifting of almost 100 sanctions, it uh, may take a month, if not years, to assess and verify the results, as Ayatollah Khamenei insists. It seems that the <clears throat> nuclear position of Iran is connected with the process in domestic policy and above all with pres presidential election uh, in Iran, which will be held in June. Ayatollah Khamenei's uh, action on nuclear issue appear to be aimed at preventing President Rouhani from playing a mean meaningful political role until the end of, of his term. This position suggests that Tehran will not engage in serious negotiation with the United States until Rouhani's successor take office and forms a new nuclear team. Until then, Tehran is ready to connect Trump cards for a future game with Washington. Tehran has dramatically strengthened in its nuclear infrastructure in recent months, not least because of law passed in December and its name, a strategic plan to counter sanctions. Uh, this law uh, gave uh, impulse to large-scale work and at last led to the significant excess of, of the uh, 2015 level of development of the nuclear industry. At the same time, the war cont uh, continues at the uh, accelerated pace. I must say uh, about the propaganda pressure, which is not rejected either. The recent statement of the Iranian intelligence minister, Mahmoud Alavi, which he made on February the 8th, uh, was sensational. He said that Iran could create a nuclear weapon if it was cornered. Iran will no longer to be blamed if they push it in this direction, he, uh, the minister said. And the former Iranian diplomat and uh, revolutionary guard general Amir Musafi said in uh, an interview with uh, Al Mayadeen TV Ayatollah Khamenei's fatwa, which uh, prohibits nuclear weapon, is not permanent according to the Shi'i uh, jurisprudence. The fatwa is used in accordance with the prevailing circumstances. Therefore, said Mr. Musavi, I believe that if the Americans and Zionists act in the dangerous way, the fatwa can be changed. 
it's a hint of the possibility of creating nuclear weapons in Iran. Of course, certainly, altogether, Ayatollah Khomeini's position on the GCPOA, the practical activation of the nuclear infrastructure, and statements about the flexibility of the nuclear fatwa is a coordinated offensive by the Iranian authorities in a propaganda war with the United States. The goal is to create a basis on the basis from, uh, of, from uh, a position on strength for the upcoming negotiation on the GCPOA. Certainly, such position of, of, this, of the parties already determine the deadlock or impasse. Of course, there is a way out of this impasse. The most acceptable option would be an agreement between Iran and the United States on a gradual, uh, simul uh, simultaneous lifting of sanctions. On the one hand, I mean American hand, and return to requirements of the GCPA on another, I mean Iranian hand. That's a step-by-step -step option. And uh, some days ago, Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei uh, Ryabkov uh, said about it. In the coming month, we should expect an increase in the Iranian-American propaganda confrontation with uh, association of each other's unwillingness to solve the problem of the GCPOA. I think that the game goes on and it gets more aggressive. However, here is the most important thing for the parties, I mean for Iran and for the United States, is not to play too much. There is a hope that sooner or later, most likely by the end of this year, Tehran and Washington, which are ready to solve the GCPOA problem in their deep desires for different, for, for different, uh, different uh, reasons, will come to the consequence. In any other case, the world is waiting for a, a real nuclear drama. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sajan. Uh, very important uh, points made. I think that we could uh, continue uh, this particular discussion with the uh, with the next speaker, um, who also um, another angle on the uh, future of the Middle East after the Arab-Israeli uh, peace talks. Yes, for the after the recent. Uh, normalization processes, as we say. Uh, so I would like to uh, invite your Dr. Hassan Ahmadian, Assistant Professor of uh, uh, Middle East and North Africa Studies at the University of Tehran. Dr. Ahmadian. Thank you, thank you. I'd like, uh, do you hear me, sir? Okay. I'm not sure if you are hearing me. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Okay, okay. So thank you, thank you for, for having me in this meeting. I'd like to thank both institutes for setting this meeting up and having me to share my views with you. I'll speak about the Middle East and uh, try to give a short overview of Iran's uh, general uh, uh, view of the developments currently uh, uh, ongoing in the Middle East. Uh, I'll mention uh, quick points in quick points uh, the peace deals that have been made, the, uh, the other issues that are being uh, talked about in the debates in Iran on the Middle East. Uh, now, of course, uh, uh, some of them are more important that I'll focus on. I'll touch upon also the JCPOA in uh, relation with the regional developments that I think has a very uh, important place in these developments. 
uh, then I'll conclude with a uh, sum up, uh, 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 you know, uh, point. So uh, let me start with a general view. And I think uh, when, when looking at the Middle East uh, from, uh, from wherever you are, you can see that there is a lot of uh, insecurity and uh, instability all around the region. This region, uh, I think the main feature of nowadays Middle East is imbalance. Imbalances are everywhere in the Middle East. The general idea is that uh, uh, the, uh, you know, there are imbalances in the, on a national level in countries, on a regional level between countries, on an international level between big powers pilling over into the Middle East that we've seen in many files and cases, including Syria, Yemen, Libya, other uh, uh, issues and files. So imbalance is there, and there are many reasons for those imbalances, specifically the regional ones. Uh, I think we cannot really boil them down to a single factor. There are different factors, variables, uh, that are uh, affecting this imbalance and making it endure. The first, I think, is a regional competition. This is a regional factor, a regional variable, uh, which has been there for decades now, and I think it will be in the Middle East uh, in, the, in decades to come as well. Uh, the other, I think, more important issue is the international, specifically the U.S. policy in the region, because the United States has been for decades the post-World uh, War II, one of the main international uh, actors present and uh, affecting the region in many uh, regional files, in many regional issues and uh, crises, its choices overweigh the regional actors' choices, and it shapes them and directs them in many cases. An example of that is when, a uh, very, very recent example is when uh, president Obama called for uh, Syrian uh, president to go. Afterwards, you could have seen, you, you, you saw how the gold rush, regional gold rush towards Damascus started, bringing in Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, to severe ties with, uh, with the Syrian government and then support the opposition and arm them and abet them to, to overthrow the region, to have a part of the cake that they thought is going to be there because the president of the United States said so. So this, even the rhetoric of the United States has a crucial impact on regional rivalries. Uh, its policies have even deeper uh, consequence for regional uh, uh, crises and uh, developments. Uh, recently, I think, so, so uh, let me, let me uh, talk a bit about this variable, then move to more closely zoom in on some of the main issues today in the Middle East. Uh, now, the U.S. policy, the past four years specifically, has affected regional balance in two uh, ways. The first, it basically talked about, or it basically tried to isolate Iran and deprive it and its allies from being engaged and uh, uh, affect regional developments. This policy, uh, basically, of excluding a regional uh, power from being present and ex exercising its, basically, regional power in the region ha have been very dangerous. It, it took us to the brink of war twice, at least, the past uh, two years. And I think uh, excluding any regional actor can be dangerous. It will be dangerous. And I think it, 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 it is not only about Iran. If you exclude Turkey, if you exclude Saudi Arabia, the results would be the same. They, are, they have original might. They cannot be excluded. Excluding them can be dangerous to the region. And, uh, and, and I think um, in every crisis, every file in the region that Iran has been present, it has tried to be part of the solution. You have a very clear vision of that in the Syrian case, in the Astana process. And I think uh, the Iranian four-point plan for Yemen as well speaks volumes of that. There's a, there's a tendency to be part of the solution, construct peace as opposed to crisis and end of crises in the region. 
this is very much, you know, a tendency by the by the strategic community in Iran. And you see it also in the Hope Initiative in the Persian Gulf and the Regional Dialogue Forum. So that was targeted by the United States in its first, uh, you know, dimension of its regional policy the past four years. The other aspect of that policy has been... Uh, uh, you know, enabling, emboldening regional allies and client states, and you see it in the in the form that the Saudis have been proactive, assertive in their regional uh, uh, policy and behavior, their policy towards Yemen, the war, ongoing war, the siege on Qatar, the uh, the imprisonment of the Lebanese prime minister, the uh, Ritz Carlton affair, many other issues, the Khashoggi affair. You see that, and comparing it to the previous stage, you couldn't see such a behavior on the part of Saudi Arabia. The other example is Turkey. In Syria, lately in Nagorno-Karabakh, also in Libya, Turkey is very assertive nowadays, uncomparable with, its, uh, with a decade ago. Even, you know, tiny, regional tiny states that didn't have a tradition of uh, regional actorship like UAE have been very much uh, trying to assert a, uh, their, their power and their influence in the region. You see it in Yemen, in Libya. The UAE has been very active in, in that sense. And they are very much like the United States. I mean, they, they can create a mess here or there and get away with it. They cannot, uh, you know, they, they have the, 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 they are in the position uh, to pay for a crisis, to create and, and basically ignite a crisis and then get away with it. Not to, uh, and that crisis might not affect them uh, that much. So it's, it's pretty much like the United States in that sense. The United States is far away, but it's uh, creating problems, have been creating problems in the region, getting away with it. I mean, in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere. So with this, I think regional, the regional uh, equilibrium lacks balance. And the United States' past policies have increased the imbalance in the region. Now, moving in uh, uh, to regional files in the new era with the election of President Biden that brought up a new space, at least in the rhetoric, uh, uh, the, the, there are things to be uh, talked of and thought of and talked about. Uh, uh, but I think we shouldn't be that much optimistic about the changes that the United States might make because uh, the United States has, I mean, President Biden, Biden has its plate full with internal uh, affairs, with uh, uh, Chinese, uh, rise of China, with the transatlantic relations, many other priorities. The Middle East, there is not much gains to be made in the Middle East for the United States, and it's not on the top of the agenda. Iran, the JCPOA, might be an exception in that regard. Uh, so beside the, you know, very much, very broad, uh, uh, rhetorical uh, way of dealing with the Middle East, there is not much really uh, uh, tangible uh, policies to be th thought of that can change drastically compared to the time of President Trump. Now, in the, the, the Middle East, I think Yemen has saw some positive signs from uh, President Biden's team, uh, excluding or taking uh, the Houthis out of the terror list and uh, calling on Saudi Arabia to stop the war, are positive signs that, that can, be, can result in, in changes in the, in the situation in Yemen. But the results are yet to be seen. The, uh, the, the Al-Ula summit, the, I think, is a result of the uh, Biden election. The Saudis ultimately decided to come to terms with their differences with the Qataris and, and hold that summit. And, and uh, then there was a compromise that I think the Saudis made not to be forced to make compromises on harder issues, including on Yemen, but specifically on Iran. Uh, now, on Yemen, they are under still under pressure, I think, and will be under pressure in the future. But on Iran, they, they, I'm afraid they, they will be excluded just as uh, in, in, the, in the past, in the nuclear negotiations. They are very much afraid of that because that can strengthen, embolden uh, Iran in their views in the region, uh, strengthen the current balance of power that they are in search of changing 
the past four years, their actions have been uh, trying to change that balance of power. So this is this is a uh, uh, this is a setting that can decrease tension, the Al-Ula summit and the compromise with Qatar. But uh, it is aimed at the at another uh, uh, goals by the Saudis. The third issue is the normalization process. Now it's called the peace process. When it comes to Iran, the Persian Gulf is a sensitive uh, lifeline, and Israelis being present there can only complicate things. For Iranians, the uh, peace uh, deals are only peaceful in names. They are warmongering, block building in Iran's adjacent uh, place, uh, you know, geography, and they are directed at Iran, just as Bibi Netanyahu point, points out. It's basically part of the regional struggle against Iran. And that's what, how the Iranians view them. Uh, but I think if not targeting Iran, Iranians can live with them. They have been living in good terms with Turkey, with its uh, peace with, uh, with Israel, with its normal ties with Israel. I think they can live with any country that can have rela relations with Israel, but uh, provided that that country or that uh, normal relations is not directed at uh, Iran. The, f the final point that I like to highlight in this context is uh, the JCPOA. I think the main priority in the Middle East for the Biden administration, if it's not uh, the main priority yet, it will be uh, for sure in the very near future because of the developments that are ongoing, uh, is the JCPOA, how to deal with it. And this is the litmus test for President Biden's new approach as it is uh, spoken of, uh, uh, the change in its uh, uh, regional policy in Middle Eastern policy, uh, because this can tell if the new administration is for or against uh, the current balance of power in the region and uh, is for or against a change in the relationship with Iran. Uh, and this is very important in the regional context because uh, it boils down to two camps in the region, one in which Iran is the main actor. So changing the rhetoric and the policy towards Iran is really uh, uh, makes a difference in, in a regional context. Uh, now, I think uh, uh, for now, the Iranians and the United States, no change really have been uh, have been uh, 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 th there haven't been any change in the U.S. policy. The maximum pressure still uh, is continuing. Iranians uh, uh, have started, uh, I mean, two years ago, they started leverage building in response to U.S. maximum pressure. Nowadays, they are exacerbating that process, and I think they will go deep into that because this is, uh, I mean, experience tells them that this is the only way to force the United States back to what it already had agreed, uh, what it already agreed on and uh, to, to, uh, to uh, you know, deliver to Iran what it already uh, uh, gained. Uh, so the Iranians will continue to build leverage. This might, as uh, Professor Shuri said, is that this might, uh, uh, you know, put China, Russia in a difficult position, but this is a strategic choice. Iranians know that, you know, uh, trying to cope with the new administration, uh, they can only make new demands. The Iranians should have their hands full, and that is through leverage building in the nuclear file, but also I think it will extend to the regional uh, aspect as well in the near future if the United States doesn't uh, uh, move fast as expected by the Iranians. Uh, in this, in this uh, situation, there's a strategic calculus in Iran that I think is valid uh, for now. That is the leverage of maximum pressure is there and can affect Iran's economy and can really change the uh, a situation, but it's very, uh, 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 very slow in, in its effect. And it can take years to produce political uh, uh, outcomes. Whereas the Iranian Dr. leverage... Medjan, I'm really sorry, maybe some final... Uh, okay, okay. Very, this is the final sentence. Okay, this is the final sentence. But, whereas for the Iranians, 
the nuclear leverage can move fast and bring down the uh, breakout time and, and the signs that uh, Professor Sajin mentioned uh, of Iran coming out of Iran are part of that policy of leverage building and pushing uh, against the new administration's approach that is not in effect, not that different from the uh, previous administration. For the Iranians, this leverage, the nuclear leverage, overweighs the maximum pressure leverage. And that's what it counts when it comes to new, uh, future negotiations with the United States. I'll leave it there and look forward for the discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmedian. Uh... I'm really, I really hope that we will have some time for discussion. But as far as I understand from the program, that uh, we are really, uh, you know, uh, maybe we should be less hopeful about that. Uh, I would like to bring in Pyotr uh, Kortunov here, uh, React program coordinator. Uh, dear uh, Pyotr, could you kindly also share with us uh, your view on the nuclear issues and uh, the prospects for uh, the GCPOA? Uh, in the future. Kindly switch on the, the, the mic. Um, I hope everything is working now, right? Well, hello everybody. Thank you very much. I would like to thank, first of all, Snap for giving me the floor and everybody else for participating in this great discussion. I think it is a great opportunity for me and for everybody else to share our opinions on this on this interesting yet rather dangerous developments in the Middle East. And a lot, have been, a lot has already been said about the GCPOA and its role in the region, but I would like to offer some of my opinions on this and probably add something to the discussion. Since we're running out of time, I'm going to be rather brief in my uh, presentation, at least we'll try to be. And first of all, I'm going to start with stressing on the importance of the GCPOA, or first of all, for everybody else involved, and especially for Russia. Uh, in Russia, it is regarded, the GCPOA is regarded as uh, the main, if not the only, uh, regional agreement that can mitigate the relations between the, uh, such rivals as the Islamic Republic and the United States of America. Uh, basically, this, um, uh, basically, this is the uh, forefront for the building of the fragile as well as secondly uh, i'd like to say that excuse me uh dear Peter, it's a kind of a bad connection yeah yeah please can, uh, continue i'm trying to uh, there's nothing i can do about it really i can speak please. slower if you like no, right, no, try. Continue, continue. It's okay. Okay, so secondly, I would like to say that despite what the Donald Trump administration is saying, was saying, I mean, and a lot of other actors in the world, uh, Russia still regards the GCPA as a good and a nearly perfect guarantee for uh, no new violations of the non-proliferation non regime not to happen in the Middle East, because one of the least things that Russia would like to see is uh, a new nuclear, nuclear power, new uh, weapons of mass destruction to appear in the Middle East. And Russia still believes that the GCPOA is a great, in, in its 2015 original form, is a great way of guaranteeing that this is not going to happen. However, currently, it is, uh, as we can see, the GCPOA is in, in a little bit of limbo situation, a very complicated one, where uh, the reconciliation between the Islamic Republic and the United States of America is rather hard, and the future of it is rather vague. Because it had been regarded that Biden administration would make a positive turn because of all the criticism for the unilateral and rather lackluster withdrawal of the Trump administration from the perfect GCPOA, or nearly perfect GCPOA agreement, thus putting on the jeopardy the whole agreement and also the crisis, putting their whole uh, Middle Eastern region under state of crisis. However, despite all the criticism, when Biden won his election. We can see that this is evidently not the case, and the Biden administration uh, isn't inclined to see a swift and smooth return to the provisions of the GCPOA agreement as they were formalized in 2015. Uh, on the other hand, uh, currently the Biden administration is trying to build up some leverage against future negotiations with the Islamic Republic and is trying to make uh, Iran and Tehran to make the first steps to, uh, towards reconciliation between 
of the two parties and seeing, seeing the uh, agreement salvaged. How, however, of course, this is really hard to see um, in the future from the Moscow's perspective, because Moscow still believes that the ball is currently in the court of the United States of America because it was Trump and the United States of America which made the great mistake of unilateral withdrawing from the um, GCPOA agreement. And it's, now it's up to them to make the first step to stretch out its hand to, to Iran and try to mitigate uh, the return to the provisions of the agreement. And for Russia, this presents a great challenge, firstly, because Russia has doesn't have a lot of options to influence either sides and, well, the process itself uh, to see the GCPOA salvaged. When it comes to the United States, obviously, there is little uh, Russia can do in influencing Washington in its decision making, even with the Trump administration still in the Oval Office, when which was much, much more sympathetic and open uh, to a dialogue with Russia. Russia still couldn't manage to force or influence push the United States to make such a decision. And now with the Biden aspiration in the Oval Office, it will be even harder, if not alone, impossible. When it comes to the Islamic Republic, I believe Russia also has there a very little room, narrow room for maneuver, because mainly because Russia doesn't really want or see Iran as making the first step. Russia has, from the twenty, um, from from the moment the United States withdrew from the GCPOA and imposed the sanctions, Russia maintained that it was up to them to make the first step, and up to them to initiate this process, and not wait for the Islamic Republic to make the first step. So it still believes that it's up to Biden's administration to do this. And last but not the least, Russia doesn't subscribe to the idea of the GCPOA being revised. As we can see, the Biden administration has made a lot of hints and even um, and even demands, I'd say, uh, for the GCPOA to be revised. Despite all the criticism that came came under Biden towards Trump's decision to withdraw from it, uh, they still believe that even when the sanctions are lifted, this is only going to be the foreplay for uh, the new agreement to come into motion for the two sides to sit on the negotiation table and. Uh, negotiate new ones that could curtail uh, Iran's activities in the Middle East, which um, uh, which the United States still believe to be a great concern of theirs. For Russia, this is not the case. Russia believes that uh, the GCPOA in its 2015 form was nearly perfect and that no amendments to it has to be done or even can be done. And then all the demands of the United States are excessive and damaging to the negotiation process. So here we come to the uh, question of what can be done about this and what can be uh, how this GCPOA agreement can be salvaged, if it can. Uh, I believe there are several ways or paths the United States has to could follow because currently it is up to the United States to make the first step and to try to persuade Iran to come to the uh, provisions of the GCPOA. First of all, as I think it has been already suggested by one of the Iranian officials, uh, the two sides could engage in a process of the simultaneous uh, return to the provisions of the GCPOA. Uh, in this case, they could find a broker, such an independent and biased one, such as the U European Union, that could offer its broker position to uh, try and see both states return to the provisions, gradually return to the position, provisions of the nuclear agreement simultaneously. In this case, both sides would not risk losing face or reputation in the face of uh, and show weakness to the other one. Uh, the second one could be, uh, again, here we can see that the United States is really running, running out of time and it has to act fast before the 21st of February when some of the, uh, which is a deadline which Iran has set for that time okay. There is not enough time for the United States to fully um, fully lift all the economic sanctions from the Islamic Republic, but at the same time, they could make some some movements towards uh, Tehran and show that it's ready to cooperate with it and to make some concessions. It don't have it doesn't have to be some really, really significant ones, like um, lifting the sanctions on the petroleum industry, which is really hard to imagine, but it could be some tribal ones, which would just show that 
the United States is willing to compromise, is willing to make a concession, and that's Iran, in this case, will not lose its face in maintaining its position as a party that can equally negotiate with all the other uh, parties to the GCPOA, even such huge economies as the United States of America. And regardless of what path uh, this country is, well, mainly the United States, because the court, the, the ball is in their court right now, and it's up to them to act. Uh, I have to say that they are all running out of time with this one, not even because of the deadline of 21st of February, but because a lot has changed since the time when the GCPOA was first negotiated and then drafted in 2015. First of all, the parliament of uh, the Islamic Republic is much, much more conservative than it had been in 2015. And secondly, which is much more important, in less than half a year, the elections are coming, the presidential ones, and bearing in mind the maximum pressure campaign and all the fallout with the that a moderate candidate will come to uh, to be the president of the Islamic Republic. And if yes, it's going to be I some may, plan, one, excuse me, one last minute, if I may. Okay, okay, I'm just finishing this, I'm wrapping it up. Uh, it was really my, my final sentence, to be honest. Uh, okay. That uh, if a more hardline candidate comes to the Islamic Republic as a president, it would be nearly impossible, or at least very, very hard to come to the provisions of the GCPOA, even, it's, even in its 2015 form, let alone negotiate an even more comprehensive one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. I think that we could. Uh uh move forward to the uh to the last speaker uh of today uh hamid reza, hamid reza azizi a member of iraq scientific council and visiting fellow at the german institute for international security affairs uh, uh dear uh hamid reza I, as far as i understand we are coming back to the syrian issue could you kindly share with us your view on the uh, prospects for trilateral cooperation between uh, Russia, Turkey, and Iran on Syria. Hamid Reza? Uh, um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, now it's better. Uh, many thanks to both Iras and Riyak for organizing this event and for inviting me. Uh, just because of the uh, uh, shortage of time, I would briefly uh, present my views on uh, the prospects for trilateral Iran-Russia-Turkey uh, um, you know, cooperation with regard to the Syrian crisis. Well, uh, as we speak now, uh, the delegations of Iran, Russia and Turkey are in Sochi to hold uh, the new round of uh, the Astana process. So uh, from a formal perspective, actually, uh, that could be seen as a sign that after four, I mean, four years since its uh, establishment, uh, the Asana process is still working and, uh, you know, the cooperation and efforts to coordinate is still, uh, are still ongoing between uh, the founding members. Uh, even more than that, uh, the inclusion of Iraq, uh, Georgia, Jordan and Lebanon to uh, the Astana format, you know, um, but uh, from an actual perspective, actually, we can say that um, after these four years of its inception, there are uh, some very serious uh, potential challenges there for the Astana process, uh, which uh, could be say that which could be said that are um, even more than before, more than one year ago even or so. Uh, those uh, challenges could, uh, you know, uh, could impact not only the cooperation between the three countries, but also uh, the whole efforts to stabilize the situation in Syria uh, in general. So I, uh, very briefly, I uh, categorize these uh, challenges into uh, four main issues. The first one is uh, changing American approach to Syria. The second one is the Kurdish issue. And then as third and four factors, we have the Israeli factor and the Adlib issue. So with regard to the changing American uh, approach, uh, actually one of the things we can see nowadays, not only in Syria, but 
uh, throughout the region in general is that uh, different actors are trying to redesign their policies and adapt them to, uh, to uh, the new US administration. Uh, especially in the case of Syria, it could be said that uh, the kind of vague and ambivalent approach of Donald Trump administration, and especially its uh, you know lack of uh, desire, lack of serious desire to get engaged in multilateral diplomatic formats with regard to Syria, was one of the main factors which uh, resulted in a kind of uh, strengthening cooperation, trilateral cooperation between Iran, uh, Russia, and Turkey. Uh, the new uh, U.S. administration under Joe Biden is yet to introduce a kind of a specific strategy for Syria, but based on the, uh, the here, um, here, <clears throat> here and there, uh, we can say that uh, the main foundations, the main pillars of this strategy are going to be um, continuation of uh, the U.S. military presence in Syria, uh, the continuation of political and economic pressures, uh, pressure on the Assad government, uh, continuing uh, to try to contain Iran in Syria at the same time as uh, trying to, uh, you know, prevent the revival of the ISIS and uh, the other terrorist groups, uh, reassuring the courts and uh, also cooperating with uh, Washington's allies within the format of, uh, within the multilateral format. Uh, uh, you know, uh, regarding the Syrian crisis. At the same time, uh, the expert, uh, the U.S. expert community, uh, interesting, uh, interestingly, there have been uh, like growing calls for uh, cooperation with Russia in Syria, especially uh, for for two reasons: uh, to contain Iran and also to, uh, you know, kind of uh, prevent the revival of the ISIS. So all these developments, uh, I think, uh, can uh, you know impact the Asana process in three main ways. Uh, first of all, uh, it's expected that I mean uh, a kind of uh, potential closer cooperation between the United States and the courts is expected to increase the um, you know uh, differences uh, between Washington and Ankara. In this case, uh, two uh, scenarios are expected for Turkish behavior. Uh, Turkey, either Turkey would, uh, you know, um, decide to get closer to Iran and Russia within the Asana format, or uh, it would try to expand its uh, options via, uh, you know, um, developing cooperation with uh, regional countries. Uh, uh, on the Syrian crisis, uh, especially GCC and Israel. Actually, this is a trend that we are uh, currently witnessing. There are still some challenges and uncertainties, but uh, that could be a factor pushing, I mean, further pushing Turkey toward that direction. Uh, so this can, this second, um, like, uh, scenario would, uh, you know, result in a kind of divergence. Uh, attitudes uh, among the Turks uh, regarding the Asana format. So that was uh, the first um, possible uh, impact of the U.S. Um, uh, you know of the changing U.S. policy. Uh, the second one is that uh, in case that uh, the United States decide to get seriously engaged in a kind of diplomatic uh, dialogue, uh, diplomatic cooperation with Russia. Uh, and especially it, if it shows uh, seriousness in reviving kind of, uh, for example, Geneva process or other multilateral formats where Russia is also uh, an active, uh, you know, player, that might, uh, you know, uh, kind of convince Russia to enter into a kind of parallel or even alternative formats, alternative to the Asana process, I mean, uh, with regard to uh, the Syrian crisis. Uh, especially, this could be especially the case between the United States still doesn't want to recognize uh, Asana process as a working format, uh, as it didn't participate in the uh, new round, uh, in the current round of, of, of the negotiations. And on the other hand, Russia knows that the West is a kind of, I mean, cannot be ignored in any kind of political process uh, for the future of Syria. So that can potentially weaken the Asana process, the cooperation with, uh, within the Asana process. And finally, the third uh, impact of this uh, U.S. approach could be uh, that if uh, the, the diplomatic track, the expected diplomatic track between Iran and the United States uh, doesn't lead to a kind of successful result, 
that could lead to uh, even more defined posture by Iran uh, against the United States throughout the region, including in Syria. That could result in a kind of escalation, which is not uh, going to be welcomed by, uh, by, by Russia and Turkey. So that would be also a challenge to the Assad process. So this was uh, the main point, actually, the, the first point. So I just very briefly will mention the uh, th uh, other three points. The second one is the Kurdish issue, uh, which is, um, again, kind of in connection with the uh, previous one. But uh, the thing here is that uh, Russia and Iran have a kind of different viewpoint toward the Kurdish issue than uh, Turkey does. Uh, Iran and Russia has been trying to solve the Kurdish issue through uh, encouraging a kind of compromise between Damascus and the Kurds. However, the expected increase in the U.S. support for the Kurds and that reassurance factor that I just mentioned uh, is expected to kind of um, uh, kind of uh, decrease their their desire to enter into a kind of compromise I mean, uh, for the Kurds, uh, to enter into a kind of uh, compromise uh, with Damascus. If that happens, there is a potential that uh, Iran and Russia would think about other options in terms of uh, putting pressure on the Kurds, uh, because the end game here has been to uh, kind of uh, uh, like secure uh, the territorial integrity of the country. So uh, part of the uh, goals of the Asana process. So that can be a potential for cooperation, more cooperation between the three Asana partners, but it can be a challenge for uh, kind of uh, stability and uh, political solution in the country. The third factor is the Israeli factor. Uh, Excuse me, can let see... me do that. Could, I, uh, could I ask you for one or two minutes? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's for sure. And, yeah. And, but, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so the third one is the Israeli factor because we can see that uh, actually there has been a kind of increase in the Israeli uh, attacks against the Iran-backed positions in Syria. So. If this continues, and at the same time, if uh, the diplomatic track between Iran and the United States doesn't go well, uh, there is a potential for Iran to show a reaction, which can, uh, especially given that Moscow has a kind of uh, favorable relations with Israel and tries to uh, stay aside of, of the conflict, that could put the whole Asana format in a kind of challenging situation. And finally, uh, we have the Edlib issue. Uh, the Adler front has been kind of silent since early 2020, but it's been mostly because of the corona situation. But uh, everyone actually knows that this is not sustainable. So, uh, but one important point was that uh, last year uh, we saw a kind of bilateral uh, cooperation between, uh, I mean, the issue, uh, the ceasefire actually was reached between Turkey and Russia without the involvement of Iran. So if it's going to continue, uh, especially given that Iran has uh, since last year uh, started to get more active in Adlib, if Russia and Turkey decide to continue on their bilateral path, uh, path and, and kind of ignore Iran in this format, that can be also a challenge for uh, the Astana process. So these are the main points, uh, opportunities and challenges as concise as I uh, could be. Sorry for taking much time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, I think that uh, uh, before uh, we give the floor to Dr. Kortunov and Dr. Sanai and Ambassador Sanai to conclude our meeting, we can ask one or two, maximum two questions of, you know, uh, maximum one minute uh, each. Uh, if there are some questions uh, to the, I think that we will address them directly to the uh, Dr. Kortonov and Ambassador Sanai. If there are one or two questions from the speakers and participants of this meeting, uh, please, but uh, uh, no more than one minute. If not, we, we, we conclude our meeting today. So I think we we will go for uh, some conclusion remarks. Uh, I would like to uh, give the floor to um, to uh, Dr. Kortnov and then Ambassador Sanai. Thank you very much, Dr. Kortnov. Uh, uh, thank you, Ruslan. I think that we had a very uh, focused and uh, a very fruitful discussion today. Of course, we failed uh, to address many important issues in detail, and I suggest that we consider 
uh, these uh, issues for our further conversations. Uh, for example, uh, my belief is that uh, probably we need to spend uh, uh, more time uh, on uh, dealing uh, with the Turkish role uh, in Syria and uh, beyond Syria. Uh, there are some uh, opportunities, but there are also certain challenges that Turkey presents to both uh, Moscow and Tehran, and definitely this is an issue uh, which is uh, growing in its importance given the foreign policy activism of the Erdogan leadership. Uh, I would also suggest that we uh, at some point uh, discuss in more detail the situation in Yemen, because uh, uh, if there is a conflict where uh, there are opportunities uh, for some kind of reconciliation, uh, Yemen is definitely uh, one of, of them, and maybe it is exactly the low-hanging fruit that we should uh, work with uh, in order to reach uh, progress on uh, other issues. I would also say that for me personally, uh, there is one uh, more dimension that um, deserves uh, our attention, maybe a special event, uh, and this is the issue of uh, potential security arrangements uh, in the Gulf. Uh, I know that uh, Iran is uh, gradually moving back from the HOPE proposal and uh, maybe this proposal uh, will be put on a shelf or on a back burner, uh, but uh, the issue of uh, confidence building measures uh, in the Gulf, in the Strait of Hormuz and uh, uh, in other uh, highly uh, risky uh, maritime areas uh, uh, clearly something that uh, uh, would make per perfect sense to discuss between Russians and Iranians. I don't want uh, to uh, go on with this list. There are many other issues which uh, call uh, for a discussion and for exchange of views. But let me just extend uh, my thanks to all participants. Uh, I personally profited a lot uh, from this conversation and I hope that uh, we will continue working in this format and that we will also have uh, more occasional papers and uh, joint reports uh, uh, to present. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ambassador Sanai, maybe some recent, uh, some last words. Okay. Thank you, Ruslan, for good organizing and uh, moderating. Uh, it was a great uh, opportunity to hear Russian colleague and Iranian experts also. I think uh, the main uh, topic is that there are there are many topics to talk and to discuss. Uh, there are some uh, questions uh, uh, need to to clear and to talk about them. Andre uh, mentioned some of them. I think trilateral cooperation of Iran, Russia, Turkey in Caucasus and in this region is important. It's really important to talk. Is possible or not trilateral? Or not Iran proposed, uh, and there was a, another proposal. Uh, uh, six sides uh, discussion in the region. Anyway, I think uh, the lateral relation of Iran, Turkey and uh, Russia is important. I think in our region, uh, uh, the influence and uh, aspect of uh, world powers uh, and the uh, international system is getting down and the role uh, of uh, regional power and the important uh, the importance of regional cooperation is uh, increased uh, so i think uh, this trilateral cooperation of iran russia and turkey how is possible and uh, uh, how how is possible to manage it? Uh, I think it's important. Uh, as Andre mentioned, uh, the peace plan in Persian Gulf uh, 
So there, the, the, there are here uh, two plans of and two projects of uh, Russia and Iran. Uh, Rus Russian Persian Gulf peace plan and Iranian that is named Gormoz also. Uh, so there are many topics uh, we, to, today. We didn't have time to talk about bilateral relation. Also, just bilateral. I think this is also main is a main topic. Uh, I'm not sure how uh, uh, the administration of United States uh, will change the politics of the United States in our region. I think for Russia is not exactly clear and for Iran also. Uh, but anyway, this is also an important to topic in our uh, bilateral relation. We, we, can, we may not ignore it. Uh, thank everybody and uh, I hope to uh, repeat such a good uh, discussions. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I think that uh, we had a very fruitful discussion, and thank you. We would like to thank the leadership of our organizations, of our esteemed organizations, and I would like to thank again uh, the Institute for Iran uh, Eurasia Studies. Uh, it's always an honor to 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 work jointly with the, with the, your team. I think that we can uh, conclude our discussion today and. Uh, I uh, hope and uh, for for the new work, and uh, we will be in touch with the uh, with the uh, team of Eras uh, to create uh, new work with the ideas that we have uh, heard now, and with the, for the for the new topics uh, to search uh, to research about. Thank you very much uh, for us all. Thank you very much. Goodbye.